Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was about 10 years ago on Thanksgiving Day when my family and I gathered for one of the last times at my Aunt Betty's house, about 75 strong in those days. I always went because we had a chance to see the extended family. We didn't live far apart. Dark County is kind of a closed community, kind of a, a closed ecosystem, if you will. But, you know, we get busy. Our lives get complicated. Uh, children, grandchildren, jobs, obligations, you know. Driving out to the country to visit relatives on a Sunday afternoon in a car, that didn't happen very much anymore. But we did on those days, whenever we got the chance, go to see the aunts, the uncles, the cousins. At any rate, one of my cousins, one of my favorite ones, well, they're all my favorite, I guess, <laughs> came that day and brought greetings from his mother. Uh, his mother at that time was in the last stages of dementia, uh, Alzheimer's, and was living in a care facility. It's kind of a jokester, and he brought this greeting, which I don't know if it was meant as a joke or as a, as a serious greeting, but it stuck with me. He said that his mother sent a message, tell my family I can't remember them, but I still love them. And we all smiled in the memory of her sitting at the end of the dining room table and asking us for the 20th time who that little girl was that just ran in front of her, uh, came back. It was kind of a moment of poignant grief and also a kind of moment of uh, quiet gratitude. It was grief because, well, our memories of a beloved aunt with a quick wit and a deep and generous wisdom who had so few memories of her own left, that kind of hit us. But there was also that measure of resilient, even defiant gratitude that, that there are some emotions like love that live beyond our memory. That even though she may have forgotten much, even the faces of her family, she remembered that we loved them and that love still bound us together. Since that day, 10 years ago, all of my aunts and uncles have gone to be with Jesus. They are committed now to my own failing memory. I thought of that day again as I read this week's passage from Jeremiah. It's one of my favorites. It describes a, a new covenant that God is making with his people. That God intends to take matters into his own hands, the relationship between he and Israel. He says, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel in those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And no longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord. They shall all know me. From the greatest to the least of them, says the Lord. When you read the Old Testament with any integrity, one of the great themes that comes out of it is God's heartache over the inability of his people to keep faith with him and his relentless determination to love them in spite of that. We may forget God, but God still loves us in spite of that. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them forth from the land of Egypt, a covenant which they broke, even though I was their husband, says the Lord. Now this, uh, this new covenant will differ from the old one in several ways, but perhaps most significantly, it is brought into existence. It is ratified not by some sacrifice, not by some ritual practice on our behalf, but by God's own decision to forget. He forgets Israel's sin. He forgets his people's betrayal. He forgets their infidelity, not, not passing it over or looking the other way, not absolving it, not even forgiving it, this time around, you know, just so you know. He erases the memory in his own head of the breach of that relationship. For, he writes, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. It's a remarkable statement from a remarkable book. That's why when I remember my aunt, it reminds me of God's love for us. Because out of love for Israel, God develops amnesia. He, he selectively decides to forget. I assume it's selective amnesia, but it's amnesia. Nevertheless, in truth be told, this is a slightly uncomfortable thing for us to consider because memory is central to who we are. Which, of course, is what makes Alzheimer's such a terrifying disease. It's not the pain. It's the forgetting. When we lose our memory, we wonder if if what we really are is gone, if we're really ourselves anymore. When we lose our memory, we wonder what, what is left. 
If you have a loved one who is or has suffered memory loss from disease or injury, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And yet this still sounds very much like the God of Israel, the God who neither slumbers or sleeps, the God who chooses to forget. What is one to make of this? Is it just a metaphor, a dramatic play on words? Does God really forget their sins, that whole sordid golden calf thingy in the wilderness? Just poof, forgotten? And what about their worship of foreign gods? Entirely wiped clean? Can God really forget? And if so, what else can God forget? So it is startling, unexpected, and somewhat uncomfortable to think about God in this way. We who are so afraid of losing our memories that our God would unthinkably set his own aside. And yet, let's be honest, there's some things I'd like to forget. There's lots of things I'd like to forget, actually, like every little slight or injury I seem to hang on to. Sometimes unsure if they're even meant to slights, but still not able to let them go. Or all those painful things that have been said over the years out of anger and hurt feelings, usually to people that I love dearly. Wouldn't it be lovely to just forget all that stuff and start over every day? I sometimes wonder, in fact, if part of Israel's problem was the fact that they couldn't forget. They couldn't set aside their own failure. They couldn't set aside their own grief their own hurt, their own loss. They couldn't forget what it was like to not trust in God or not to be afraid of life on the other side of the wilderness beyond Egypt, beyond the neighboring country that threatened them. They couldn't forget the habit of whoring after other gods or, ever, or customs that the neighbors had and they, they thought were nice. And most of all, they couldn't forget their own habit of faithlessness. And not being able to forget, well, as the historian said, those who do not remember history are doomed to repeat it. Which is why God does what Israel cannot do. What you and I cannot do. He, he forgets in response to their failure and their infidelity. He forgets in response to their sin and their brokenness and their very real wretchedness. He forgets. His memory doesn't have to be pushed or prodded. It's just not there anymore. He forgets. And if God can forget, perhaps we can too. Perhaps... The thing we can remember is not how broken we are, how sinful the world is, how bad things can be, but how loving and how faithful our God is. Perhaps if God can let go of the things that separate him and us, we can let go of the things that separate us from each other. And it's not easy. I'm not even sure it's possible. Because I know that some hurts have marked us so deeply. We just can't assume that they're easy to forget. And I don't want someone feeling like a failure because they can't. But at the same time, I think we need to remind each other of God's promise to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. To forget all those things that, that keep us from being in relationship with him. So that in the absence of a cycle of memory, we can imagine what a life can be like on the other side of all that pain. I still think of my aunt whenever I hear that passage. I know full well that for, the forgetting that this passage is talking about is not the same as the forgetting that she experienced. But in her forgetting, toward the end of her life, she came to a place of peace, of remarkable peace, in fact. Now, the road to that place was not easy. It was difficult. It was painful for her and for all those who loved her. But amidst the pain, it occurred to me after she was gone that something graceful happened because, you see, my Aunt Elsie was a survivor of this place, Sachsenhausen. Her mother, her brother, her sister, her father died in that place. That's 150,000 pairs of shoes that are stacked up in the museum next to that place. I suspect that the shoes of her brother are somewhere in that pile. In the end, she forgot it all. The pain, the anger, the horror, the things that weighed on her heart for years. They all paled in the single simple knowledge that we loved her. And she loved us. I don't know. Was she herself when she died?
probably not, but I can tell you this, she wasn't forgotten. Nor did she forget what it meant to love and to be loved. And to the degree that we can ever remember that, well, I think that's the only thing that really matters. And I believe that somehow in the midst of all that, she found a connection to the God of Jeremiah, chose to forget our sin, but to remember his love for sinners. Tell my family, I don't remember them, but I love them. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. To God be the glory. Amen.